hello, hello, hello. Good to see you all. I'm gonna kick things off today with a little old-fashioned audience participation. Don't worry, I won't ask you to hug your stranger neighbor or anything creepy like that. I'm just gonna ask you a few questions. And you can answer by putting your hand up. Okay, so who here knows the difference between qualitative research and quantitative research? Okay, so that's almost all of you. If you don't know, don't worry. We're all here to learn, and the answer will follow in a minute or so. If you do know the difference, how many of you prefer quantitative data over qualitative data? Couple of hands, don't worry. I don't usually bite this early in the day. Um, now, tell me, why do you prefer quant over qual? Anybody? Chad? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have said this earlier. Please answer with numbers only. <sighs> yes. That's right, and thank you, Chad. Um, I just roped you into a reenactment of one of my favorite XKCD cartoons. A cartoon that not only explains the difference between quantitative research, how many, and qualitative research, why, but also makes it very clear that we need both. Now, in qualitative research, as Michael has already mentioned, questions are very important. And you might think, well, that's easy, right? I ask questions every day. Eh, no. See, in qualitative research, you can't just ask people what you want to know. Now, it's not just me saying that. This is one of my absolute user research heroes, Erica Hall. And what this means is that you might have a research question, like, for example, how well does our website answer prospective customers' questions? And that's great, that's what you want to find out. But you can't just ask that question literally to your customers, because the question is too big, it's too broad. It pertains to the value proposition on your homepage, to the quality of the copy on your product page, the clarity of your pricing page, the flow of your funnel. If you ask a question like this to customers, they will think very deeply and not necessarily come up with true answers. But because you ask them, they will try to say something. And that's not great. You see, your research question is not the same as the survey or the interview questions you should answer. What you should do is break up that research question into more manageable little chunks that you can ask your users directly. Like, for example, if this is your research question, a survey question could be on the checkout, what's holding you back from completing your purchase today? Or in an interview, you might ask, talk me through your most recent um, ship, uh, sh shopping experience on our website. Now, you may have noticed that so far, I have only spoken about surveys and interviews as research methods. And especially people who know me might be thinking two things. And the first thing is, not user testing. I thought you were an old school usability gal and you loved user testing. This is true, I love user testing. But user testing is not about asking questions. User testing is about setting tasks because user testing is about observation of behavior. Another thought you might have is, well, yeah, interviews else I can get behind, but surveys, really. All those terrible pop-ups we saw earlier. <sighs> yeah, I know, surveys are not the most popular research method, and some people I respect very much in this industry have even gone so far as on conference stages to say that surveys suck. Now, of course, these people shall remain nameless, and faceless, um, but I will say that I disagree vehemently with this. 
You see, I take a much more nuanced position, which is that most surveys suck. <laughs> now, people sometimes ask me, if this is a method that so many people you know, get wrong, shouldn't we just stop doing this? Please, do not get me started on the horror show that is A-B testing in most places, okay? So, yeah, back to surveys. Surveys can be good user research if you get your questions right and if you dissuade yourself from the idea that you need to impose statistics on your survey results. You need to stop thinking numbers and start thinking patterns, gathering information. Now, there are um, a number of things that are important specifically for surveys, specifically for interviews, but there's also quite a few things that are the same for both. And I'll first dig into that before we go deeper into each specific research method. Well, first of all, of course, you have to ask the right questions. And one of the things you should really refrain from doing is expecting your customers, your users, to be psychics to be able to tell the future. I hope this comes as no surprise to you, but nobody can do that, okay? So asking questions like, if we add feature X, would you use our app more regularly? It's just basically asking to be lied to. Don't do that. On the other hand, don't ask people questions about things that are too far in the past. If you want to know what people think of your onboarding, how that went, get them while they're fresh. Get them while they've just gone through that experience. Don't wait six months. They won't remember that anymore. Human memory is extremely unreliable. Now, of course, it should go without saying that you shouldn't ask leading questions either. Now, what are leading questions? Leading questions are questions that, in themselves hold the desired answer. Now, Michael said you will get sent a survey after the conference, and imagine if one of the questions was this. How good was CXL Live? Now, I'll admit my intonation might add a little bit to the bias, but seriously, this is like saying it was good. We just want you to tell us how good it was. If you phrase the question like this, more people will say it was good or very good. Now that might be nice for your results, but it's not really true. A way to overcome that is to have both the positive and the negative version of the adjective in your question. How good or bad would you say CXL Live was? How fast or slow would you rate our customer service? Or you could just leave it out altogether. How would you rate CXL? Now, sometimes it can be interesting to bias your question, but to bias it towards the negative. Let me show you an example. This is the survey that Dutch insurance company Central Beheer uh, did after people finished a task on their website. They asked people, how hard was it to reach your goal? And they got, okay, customer satisfaction rates, and what they also got in the ensuing open question was a lot of feedback for improvement. Now, they wanted to get their numbers up, they wanted to get their customer satisfaction rates up, so what they did was they changed the question to the wonderful, it was easy to reach my goal. And, well, yeah, customer satisfaction numbers did go up, but you know what plummeted? The useful feedback that they got. Far fewer people gave them input that they could do something with. So what did they do at Central Beheer? They realized what was important, and they went back to the first version of the question. Because like me, they know you do these kinds of surveys not to present pretty numbers to management, but to get actual information that can inform your experimentation, that can help you with your copywriting. Now, leading questions you shouldn't ask, 
But there's also such a thing as a loaded question. And a loaded question doesn't hold the answer in the question itself, but it does contain information that could lead to bias. Again, let's think to the survey that CXL will send you at the end, and imagine they would ask you something like this about the speakers. How do you rate last year's number one speaker, not a word of a lie, Elsa Arts? That's insulting. That's almost like daring you to rate this speaker low. That's like asking, how did you like best-selling authors new book. Now, leave it out. What you want is neutral feedback. That is what we are really, really after, okay? Um, now, you might think, eh, these examples, are you just making them up because surveys in the wild are better, really? <laughs> no. This is a survey by the Dutch version of Business Insider magazine. Now, the Dutch speakers in the room will already be giggling softly to themselves. They're so, so quiet, these Dutch people. Um, I'll translate for you. First question is, which word do you think describes Business Insider best? And the options are surprising, useful, fun, reliable. Um, really? Not a single negative in there? Why did you do this survey? To make sure you had a great start to the office party? What is wrong with you? And see, this is one of the reasons why you need what I call good question hygiene. Whenever you set up a survey, whenever you write a scenario for interviews, test it. Let somebody else read it, test out the scenario, do a run through, and if you're about to send a survey to all of your customers, to all of your users, do a test run. Send it to a small batch first. Have a look at your answers, and if you see some funky stuff, it just might be because you asked the questions wrong. Take a look at the order, take a look at the way you phrased it. Okay. So these are the general things about questions that go for both surveys and interviews. Now, let's have a deeper look into surveys. Now, for today, I'm gonna focus not on market research surveys, but on those surveys that you can do and that you saw in the, in the intro in the beginning with tools like Usabilla or Hotjar, surveys that pop up to your website visitors. Now, what is very important when doing these is to get your time and your place right. As was evidenced when I visited the government website of my beloved home country, Belgium, the other day. Belgium, probably known best to you as the capital of Brussels. Um, so I did a search on the website, and sadly, no results matched my search. In itself, not great, but then, goodpeopleofbelgium.be decided to add insult to injury to take that moment to ask me, how is your experience going? <laughs> how do you think my experience is going? You just asked me this on a page that you know will irritate me. Don't do that. Now, a lot of people get their timing, their placements of these surveys not quite right, which is why I've designed and you will see I use this word very loosely. I have designed a pop-up survey decision chart. Yes. See, based on the reason why you're doing the survey, the chart will tell you when to do it and where to do it. Now let's start with one of my favorite surveys, which is the Top Task Survey. Top Task Survey is designed to find out what people are there on your website to do. Now, you might think Google Analytics takes care of that for you. It doesn't. Google Analytics tells you what people do on your website, not what people want to do. That's why we do this. Now, the phrasing of this question is very important. We usually ask, what is the purpose of your visit to this website? Or, what question brought you to our website today? The addition of please be as specific as possible was very important for us for this question because it meant we got a lot more high quality answers. 
a lot less people filled out information, info, just looking, looking for information, stuff that you can't do anything with. Now, what we really want here is to capture people's real intent and their own words. And this is why you should show this survey before people have even actually seen your website. Because your menu, the way you word things, can influence them. And we don't want that. We want to capture true voice of customer information here. Which is why we show this survey, boom, in the middle of the screen and upon entry. Like the chart says. Now, if you haven't done this top task survey, and if you're straight up e-commerce, it's not super valuable. If you're anything else, do it. It's great. Now, a survey you're probably more familiar with is the exit survey, a survey that appears when you leave a page without doing what the website really wants you to do. Now, this is an example from HubSpot Academy, where on a training page, if you left the site without signing up for the course, there was a little pop-up slid up from the bottom that said, not for you, tell us why. Now, this might seem like a very broad question, but that's great, because that means you can get all sorts of input. And the HubSpot team used it for ideation, for thinking about, okay, how can we make this better, for A-B testing. Input from this survey led to a 10% increase in signups. There is a downside to this kind of survey, and that is usually when we do this, we see about a response rate of about one to 3%. Now, when you're HubSpot, that don't matter. They've got visitors galore. When you're a very small website, when you don't have a lot of visitors, one to 3% is not great. So what we did was we tried to put it in the middle of the screen. Now, it might look to you as if it's on the left. Trust me, it was really in the middle. I've just left some space for the translation. Because how you phrase this, again, is very important. Because putting this in the middle is more intrusive. It's true, you're only intruding on people's exits, but still, it's polite to say, I realized what you were doing. Please hold, hang on a minute, wait. Got one more question for you. What's the most important reason you didn't make an appointment today? We tried both this version and the slide in for our client car glass. Um, I think you have it in the US as auto glass. Safe light. Safe light? Yeah. Safe light. There you go. Thank you very much. Audience participation once more. Um, and we got 2.5 times more responses by putting it in the middle as opposed to on the side, as the chart says. Now, of course, you can do surveys for a number of other reasons, and I would always advocate use one of those slide-ins. They're less intrusive, right? It's more polite to do it that way. And probably the most important thing on this wonderful chart is when you should do these, and that is, of course, that it depends, and you have to think about this, duh. Charts like these don't exist. You always have to think, what is the question I want to ask? What does that mean for when I show it? Do I only show it to people who have seen a particular part of this page? Do I only show it to people who have maybe visited a minimum of three product pages within a certain category? All of these things are things you need to consider when thinking about the trigger for your survey. Okay. As much as pop-up surveys are a great, easy, and cheap way to get feedback from your visitors, I don't like them on confirmation or thank you pages. On confirmation or thank you pages, I prefer to put the survey in the page itself. You see, this is an excellent moment to ask people questions because they these people like you. They have just either given you money or 
requested something or, in the case of Friarlight, booked an appointment. So you thank them, you give them the information about um, the confirmation, and you can ask a number of questions. In this case, we ask them, was there anything that almost stopped you? If they said yes, what prevented you from booking an appointment? And what could we have done to make it even easier for you? Now, this set of questions you can mix up. You can ask these questions this month, and next month you can ask, thank you for choosing us. Did you consider a competitor before booking with us? If so, what? characteristics that we have made you choose us over them. Now, you may have noticed that in most examples that I've shown you that there were mostly open questions. That's because for conversion research, I prefer those. Because you just get such a wealth of information and you get really true voice of customer data that can inform your experimentation, but also your copy, as Joanna will talk about later. Now, when you do ask open questions, you have to be prepared that people will use the type in field not only to answer your question. If you want to learn new swear words, doing a survey with open questions is a great idea, right? Um, if you can't handle filth very well, never, ever survey university students. <laughs> Gross stuff. What you should also be aware of is that sometimes people will ask a direct question in this type and field. And this is actually your chance to be customer centric. Don't just set a survey and forget about it. Ideally, you have your customer success team follow up the survey very closely. Now, I know this is not always possible, so do the right thing, and on your thank you page, refer to your customer service, phone number, contact information to make sure that you're really helping people out. Yes, we're doing user research. Yes, we're gathering data for ourselves, but that doesn't mean the customer has to suffer. Okay, so these are some things that are important when we're doing surveys. Now, interviews. Of course, remember, quality of questions is very important. Good question hygiene, all things to consider equally for surveys and interviews. When you do interviews, I would implore you, when you recruit, to not call it an interview. An interview sounds, well, sort of formal and official. Now, call it a chat. Hi, would you be up for a quick chat about our new product? Also, treat it like a chat. Have a conversation with your user, with your customer. Does that mean you shouldn't have a scenario prepared? Oh, you should. You should definitely have a scenario prepared with good questions. And you should also have anticipated a number of ways the answers could go and have probes to dig deeper. But very often you'll find that when you ask the first question, people will start talking and keep on talking and talking and talking, and they will actually also have answered your question number two and maybe five. Now, the worst thing you can do is when that person stopped talking, just go grab your piece of paper or your list of questions and go, so, question two. They've just answered this. It's a sign of disrespect. You wouldn't do that in a conversation. This immediately flips the atmosphere and turns it into interview again. No. Yes, your questions are important, but the main thing you should do in an interview is listen. Listen to what your customer is telling you. Because the only question you should always keep in the back of your mind is your original research question. What are you trying to find out? Thank you very much.
Charles. That's Thank awesome, you. Awesome as always. We got some questions for you. If we can get them up. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the one that is currently most popular is, what are your thoughts on NPS? Yes. Well, I know NPS is a very hotly contested uh, topic. There's a Twitter war going on between Jared Spool, an old school usability guru, and uh, measuring um, usability. Jared Spool is dead set against the NPS. Measuring usability is for. I am not the biggest fan of the question, what is, what, what is it, exactly is the question again? So how, how likely is it that you would recommend this to your friend or colleague? Ugh, what? How likely is it? And also, a friend? If you are a person that recommends cloud software to friends, <laughs> I don't want to be your friend, OK? Um, so the score, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly hung up about. It's a weird scoring system as well, let's be honest. But the main thing is, is that you ask a follow-up question. If people score you anything between a one and a six, you should say, we're sorry to hear that. Mm. How can we do better? If they score you a seven and an eight, you should ask, thank you. What can we do to improve? If people give you a nine or a 10, you say, lovely. What's the one thing we, what's the one thing we could do to improve? Wow. It's again, turning it into real qualitative feedback and not just go by those numbers. It's fantastic advice right there. Any suggestions for exit polls on mobile websites since they don't have mouse movement to detect exit like on desktop? Yeah, this is, this is a great question because I had it in, but I didn't think I had enough time. Yeah, no, there is no exit on mobile. So there you will always have to go for a delay survey and you'll have to sort of really look at the page where you want to do the exit intent and have a look at what's the best time for me to show this? What is the, or is there, is it timing? Uh, is it time on page combined uh, with a certain scroll depth, for example? And basically the thing is, have a look at your analytics, set the trigger, and watch your answers. <laughs> if almost zero come in, it's coming too late. If you get a lot of answers, but all of them are, what are you doing? I haven't, I haven't even looked this page yet. You've said it too soon. This is also something that you need to experiment with. Try a few different settings. I'm very curious to hear your answer here. Does incentivizing a survey inherently bias it? <sighs> I'm not a huge fan of um, incentivizing a survey, um, but I don't, I'm, I, I'm not aware of, of, of the research behind it, so, but I would say if you can avoid it, avoid it. Okay. This one is a good, nice and chunky one. Are there cultural differences or preferences we should consider uh, with how the surveys pop up? Thinking about the different definitions of intrusive. Right. I think this is a very interesting one. And um, as you may have noticed, I am a white woman. Um, and so I can't, and I'm from Belgium. <laughs> Might have mentioned that. So I have, for example, no idea how it would work in India. I have no idea how it, it, this would work in, in, in Nigeria. I know nothing about these cultures. So I would get somebody involved who does, which is not me. Yes. And I think we have time for one more. Um, uh, with open-ended questions, how would you process the answers so that we are able to meaningfully act on them? Yeah. And then actually maybe we could tag on one there. Because if we're not supposed to use any stats for, for qualitative stuff, then how do we segment? Um, well, basically, analyzing the answer, spreadsheets. <laughs> spreadsheets are your friend. Basically, what you do is you also you like tag the answers. Like, what are these answers about? And this is how you get to see patterns. This is how you get to see um, patterns not just on, in general on your site, but also, for example, on specific pages or specific page types. There might be uh, something that comes back very often on your homepage. That would be a top task to put on your homepage. If something is a top task, but people only enter it basically when they're on the page themselves, it means your SEO is working quite well. This is fine. Happy days. But you need to do the work. <laughs> You need to really put in some time to properly analyze these questions. 
I love reading survey answers because you really get a very, very good sense of what your customers are trying to tell you. And so analyzing that properly and then turning that into insights and ideas for testing. Okay. Thank you so much, Els. Thank you very much.